The following podcast contains quite a bit of explicit and slightly fruity language. If you're listening to this somewhere where you have young children, you might want to pop in your headphones. Now, on with the f- show. So a sense of humour is kind of the engine oil of doing stuff in dark and difficult places. And it's my shield. Welcome to the Humorology podcast with me, Paul Barros, and my glittering lineup of guests from the worlds of business, sport, and entertainment, who are going to share their wisdom and their use of humor. Humorology is the study of how humor can dramatically improve your business success and your life. Humorology puts the fun into business fundamentals, increases the value of your laughing stock, and puts a punchline back into your bottom line. Please remember to like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. My guest on this episode of the Humorology podcast is a multi-award winning investigative journalist, writer and presenter who describes himself as old school. He's considered fearless and seems to happily go where other journalistic angels fear to tread. He becomes transformed into a power ranger in the presence of the connected trying to shut ordinary people up and has created an extraordinary career by speaking truth to power. He has covered wars and revolutions in more than 60 countries and somehow manages to retain his droll sense of humour in the face of fiends, fundamentalists and the fragility of life. His relentlessness and acerbic wit has enabled him to rattle a few cages, ruffle a few feathers, and run rings around the wrong ends. John Sweeney, welcome to the Humorology podcast. Hi. Hi, Paul. Pleasure to be here. It's fantastic to listen to all that alliteration. Uh... (laughs) I thought you might spot that. I don't understand humorology. I don't think it works. And goodbye. (laughs) <laughs> this has been the best and shortest podcast we've ever done. Hurrah! Um, well, I said in the introduction that uh, you'd been 60 wars and revolutions. How important is a sense of humour in those situations? But I, weirdly, it's very important. And I actually feel really quite evangelical about this. It's 1994 and I'm a, a reporter for The Observer. And um, there are a small number of Bosniak, Bosnian Muslim, um, they're they're kind of settlements which are almost overrun by the Bosnian Serbs, effectively under the sway of the Serb strongman Slobodan Milosevic. One of them is a place called Bihać. And um, with difficulty, uh, we arranged um, with the help of the... um, it was actually the French Foreign Legion working in part of the UN um, would escort us down this terrifying mountain track down to Bihat so we could talk to the people there, have, you know, um, how are you doing for food? Does the hospital run out of oxygen? That kind of journalism. Essentially, we're in a car driven by a French aid worker and it's a, like a tiny uh, Renault 4 or something like this. French... Um, French aid worker, French, it was a lady and another lady in the front, and then uh, me and this other guy, who I've never met before, um, um, were in the back. We're driving down this road, and then the Serbs start shooting at us. And what, what the consequence is that we are front and back are big, massive French uh, Foreign Legion Army transporters. And as the bullets start flying, they put their lids down, uh, so they're secure. Um, But we're in um, what they call a soft skin. I mean, if if one of these bullets lands, we're all, you know, we're in trouble. The the driver, who's good, but you can feel her fear. I mean, there is a bit of snow, um, but it's it's snow going to, to mud, so a bit slivery. And she's trying to hunch down while driving because you can hear the bullets crack. And it's very fucking frightening. I can swear, can't I? Yes. Yeah. And um, the um, and the guy sitting next to me says, "I know who you are. 
you're the bloke who fell asleep in the Devereux strawberry pavlova. And, and, I, and I said, yes, yes, that's embarrassing. How do you hear about that? And basically, there was this wonderful bloke called Sean Devereux, who was a fantastic aid worker for UNICEF. He got shot dead in 92 in Kismayo in Somalia. And, and as an observer reporter, I didn't know Sean, but I, uh, his family are lovely. Um, Jerry Devereux, his father, and Maureen, the mum. And I wrote a piece for the Observer magazine about what a hero Sean was, which got turned into a TV drama. So to thank me, um, Jerry and Maureen um, invited me and the photographer who'd, who'd done the original story round for dinner. Jerry used to be the number one um, um, air steward for British Airways. He used to serve the Queen, um, doesn't drink much. The Duke of Edinburgh doesn't drink much. The Queen Mum drinks like a fish. He had, he had a drinks trolley. Um, so we were, um, he had a drinks trolley and the moment you, 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 I'd finished my glass of Chardonnay or whatever, he would top up like you were in first class. And the thing is, I'm a drinker. Uh, and also, uh, to be honest with you, although this was a celebration of our piece, which had led to this, this lovely um, dramatization of their son's heroism, it was also fundamentally unbearably sad. And the combination of this kind of speed drinking, which I can do, and the, the sadness of it, and also I think I'd just come back from somewhere dark, I don't know where it was, but I fell asleep uh, and I fell asleep as pudding arrived and I crashed into the strawberry pavlova with, you know, um, glasses covered in meringue. And uh, they left me there for a while and then I woke up. I was like, oh God, I'm terribly sorry. And Roger, the observer contemporary, said, what the fuck are you doing, sweetie? Falling asleep. <laughs> like, like, anyway, so this story is fucking haunting me. I'm going down the road. We're all about to die. You're the bloke who fell asleep in the Devereux Strawberry Pavlova. I'm kind of infamous in the UNICEF family for being the terrible journalist. And I said, it's true. I'm terribly sorry. And then the French uh, women in the front. So, you know, well, what's, um, you know, I'm going to say, I'm going to try and say, what, the, what, are you, what are you laughing at? You know, um, blah, 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 blah. And we kind of, in bad French and English, we explain the story, and they start laughing. And, and the ghost of Sean gets us all the way down that mountain. And when we get down to the bottom, um, the, the French Foreign Legion guys, you know, they're really worried about us. Are we okay? Were we shot? You know, where are we from? When we get out of the car, we're laughing. We're laughing so much, I've got my flat jacket on inside the, the thing, and I can't... I'm laughing so much I can't, I fall over and I can't get up because I'm laughing so much. And we sit there, uh, we lie there like the kind of beetles the wrong way around, you know, flapping our legs and arms flapping because we're laughing so much. We're laughing because we're still alive, that's nice. We're laughing because of the memory of me falling asleep and the Deborah's strawberry pavlova. But what's weird about this is it's not weird and when you meet proper soldiers, proper airmen, proper sailors who do, who do their stuff, that you know that one of the weird things about war is the comedy of it. And, and that, um, that you can have in terrible, terrible dark moments, you can uh, have um, tremendous moments of humor and hilarity. And another thing, is that if you're in a car and you're joking with each other and there's something wrong or you're worried about something, you can express it in the context of a joke or a jokey conversation. So you communicate better. And so all my time when I was working on stories uh, like Scientology or um, um, uh, the Russian secret state spying on us all the time, I would always want to work with people who had a great sense of humor and we banter all the time. They take the piss out of me all the time because I'm an arrogant prick. And, um, and they actually say, you're an arrogant prick, John, that's a problem. And, and therefore, if there's something somebody's seriously worried about or anxious, 
then you say it in that context and then information moves around. So a sense of humor is kind of the engine oil of doing stuff in dark and difficult places. And it's my shield. So it opens up the lines of communication as well, as well. once you, uh, but is it also, also the aspect of that's the ultimate bonding tool, isn't it? So you get to trust people through it. Yes, and I completely, and I don't, if people don't, um, I don't trust people who don't have a sense of humour. Um, and, and, the, and, the, and, the, um, and the sense of, and a willingness um, uh, to be mocked. And people, psychopaths, people like Trump, hate humour because of that. Um, there's a, one of my heroes in life, and I've never met him, but he wrote this tremendous book about cults. Uh, his name is Professor Robert Lifton, and he was an American. One of the things Lifton writes in his book about cults and the authoritarian, the totalitarian mindset, is that the um, tolerance of humour, tolerance of mockery, is is something that the totalitarians don't do. A sweet example about of this is that British propaganda in 1939 was dreadful. It was it was too stiff and too boring. And um, a clever, really funny um, film director said, you know, we want to do a film. And um, this guy came away and said, well, how about this? And it's the, um, the SS marching to the tune of the Lambeth Walk. And, um, and what you have is um, five seconds of them marching, and then it goes, da 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 And then they go backwards oh, and then forwards. <laughs> and everybody laughed and everybody loved it. And also you're taking the piss out of tyranny. So it, it's a simple um, rule of my life that whenever you come across somebody who doesn't do a sense of humour, there's a problem. With Scientology, I'm working with two wonderful um, BBC um, colleagues, Sarah Moll, my producer, and Bill Brown, Northern Irish cameraman. Uh, by the way, Northern Irish, BBC Northern Irish cameraman means tough as old boots, because, you know, they've really, 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 really been in the middle. And if it's a riot, you think, crikey, this is a riot. And I said, no, you should see the Falls Road. <laughs> I said, okay, okay, okay. And so there, there is nothing that I can I can do that's worse than what uh, Bill's been through. Sarah's really funny. She's from Essex, and her plan is simple. We said, "Eh, John, you seen Jurassic Park, ain't ya?" I said, "Yes, I have." And she said, "Yeah, in it, there's this bit where they tether this goat, and then the T Rex comes and gets it." Well, John. Scientology, they're the T-Rex, and you're the tethered goat. You can bleed, can't you? And that was the plan, and it worked beautifully. And all we had to do was carry uh, two cameras with us at all times, a little camera with batteries, which we could switch on instantly if Bill's big camera wasn't working for some reason. So everywhere we went, we had two cameras as a policy. Everywhere we went, I had two sound packs on me. So if one set of batteries went down, I had the other. It meant going to the loo a fucking nightmare because I had to, basically, I was like electricity, um, a small electricity substation. I had so many batteries in me. But it meant that never once were we screwed. We go into battle with the Church of Scientology. And... It was the funniest film I've ever made because they're so fucking nuts and also humorous about themselves. And what was strange was that we were dealing all this time with time with this guy, Tommy Davis, who, who I ended up screaming at and shouting at. I had to apologize. It's wrong to lose your temper, but they drove me nuts. And I can remember saying to Sarah on the seventh day, it said, Sarah, I can't do this anymore. And she said, shut up, get on with your job. <laughs> anyway, um, in the middle of all of this, there's a point when I said to Mike Rinder, the other PR man for Scientology, could we, you know, can we interview your Pope, this guy called David Miscavige, another humorous bastard in my view. They say that I'm a bigot, blah, blah, blah. And um, he goes, no, John. And I said, why not? Because you're an asshole. And uh, 
Sarah and I mean, we were filming, we filmed everything, but we've got so much stuff we don't need to put everything in. And Sarah and Bill just stopped, <laughs> they put the cameras down and started laughing so much. And then uh, and then Sarah started saying, So the reason you won't give us an interview with your Pope is because John's an asshole. And uh, uh, my runner says, Yes. I said, I can understand that's right. Yeah, you are an asshole, John. And, and she took the piss out of me and Bill took the piss out of me. And there's a moment when I could see that Mike found this distressing because we were a good gang and in a good gang, you can take the piss out of people. Yeah. And eventually, he after that film, he left the Sea Org and three years later he sat in a chair opposite me having left the Church of Scientology and said it was one of the moments was when Sarah and Bill started taking the piss out of me that he thought he could never do that inside Scientology. So he actually saw the relevance of being able to put the joke on yourself. How important do you think that is to be able to laugh at yourself essentially? It's, it's crucial for good well-being also it makes life more fun do you think that because uh, my father was brought up uh, my father was hungarian brought up under a totalitarian regime and he said exactly the same thing you couldn't you know laugh at you know that he escaped in 56 um and they hated the laughter do you think that one of the things that was the downfall of trump was that the lincoln project actually used humour against him. Do you, do you think that had an effect? Yes, I think it has a massive effect. Um, and, and that Trump and Trump's people couldn't uh, retaliate with a good joke. So, so he didn't have anybody in there who could... There could... was nobody inside his world who could say, no, come on, we can fight back with this. Um, and uh, I, I thought that the, um, um, the Lincoln Project was phenomenal. In, in doing that but I'm also I'm I, I mean I'm always on the side of the people with the best jokes they may not always win they like Trump won in 2016 but Hillary was a bit boring um as well uh, Biden is more fun and Biden got this reputation with um with Obama of of sneaking in jokes and um and, and, and we haven't seen it in display um, much, but, um, but I would um, I'd put money on it that Biden is more fun to be around with than Trump. Uh, I met Trump in 2013 and I challenged him um, about his um, friendship um, with a, a Russian born gangster called Felix Sata. And Sata had been to. Um, um, He'd been to prison for um, stabbing another, he was in Wall Street and he got into a row with this other guy and he broke off his margarita glass and shoved this broken stem of it in this guy's neck. And the guy had 110 stitches in his neck. And I say to Trump, listen, why didn't you uh, say to this guy, Felix say to you're connected with the mafia, you're fired. And Trump said, well, maybe you're thick, John. And he gets up and walks out. And he offers his hand, and I refuse to shake it. My picture on Twitter is of Trump putting his hand out to me, standing up, looming over me, and I'm sat down, my hand flat at him, saying, no, I've got one more question, which was, why did you buy your concrete from Fat Tony Salerno? And, like, by the way, there's a clue, folks. But Tony was <laughs> a crime boss for the Genovese crime family, but also related to the Gambino crime family. He, his concrete was dirty, and the concrete for Trump Tower was Fat Tony's. There's one more thing I want to say before I forget it, um, which is I've seen some terrible things um, in the world, but it's always world when things are in the dark, and humour, at least some of the time, can help shed light I can also get you through those dark things. So there's a particular, there's a gruesome example. Actually, both examples are gruesome. Um, I, I did in 88 as a young freelance reporter um, 
for the Observer before I got my job, I went to Rwanda, Burundi, and there was a small series of massacres, nothing like as dark as the ones that happened in 95. And we knew there was a mass grave, um, but there was an army roadblock. And these guys with guns were preventing us media from, from France, from Belgium, from Britain, to, to see the evidence of their war crimes. And, and I was so inexperienced and, again, an arrogant prick that I wouldn't take no. And there's like 12 journalists, but I'm the guy, and I go for the, um, I think, Burundian officer, and I go for him um, big time. And um, I win the argument, they let us through. But as we go through, I get in the car, somebody's giving me a lift because I've got no money, I'm freelance, I'm on my own. And this Belgian reporter says, you remind me of, uh, of John Cleese in, in, in Faulty Towers. <laughs> Thank you very much, fuck you. But no, he said, well done, <laughs> you were like John Cleese. I was, and it's kind of embarrassing, but anyway, I was. Um, and I can be. Anyway, we got there, we took the pictures, we talked to some people. You could smell um, the mass death and we found some bones. Um, and, and they... Basically, there was enough for us to tell um, the authorities, go and hunt, you know, find this place. We got enough. Not, not a crystal clear story, but a sense that something very dark had happened and we had some evidence. So we had to get out of there before they rejoined the bones. And as we drove away, there's a car full of good people, good reporters, four of us, five of us. And we've seen something fucking awful and we know that we haven't seen the half of it. And as we're driving, it starts to rain and it's been raining and our wheels pass some poor African guy. And there's a huge puddle, the roads are shit. And we soak the poor guy in this puddle. And we all start laughing in a kind of embarrassed way. We're laughing because it's funny, because the, the guy's wet, but it's not the end of the world. Um, and we're laughing because there's some emotional release. And then I find myself singing Dem Bones, Dem Bones, Dem Dry Bones. <laughs> like, like, so what do you do? I mean, listen, you know, there's not a psychiatrist around for about a thousand miles. There's nothing we can do, but we're taking the piss. And it's a shield. It's a shield. Your dark sense of humour is a shield. And again, I talk to coppers, firemen, ambulance people, um soldiers uh, you know yeah you see terrible fucking things and you have to deal with them in some way doctors too nurses the same you've got to remember a dark sense of humor it's your fucking shield and hold on to it i love the idea that it's your shield because i i i do think that if, if i mean if you can laugh at a problem it diminishes it gives you a bit of a, a moment of humanity of, 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 of ordinary stuff. And so it helps you deal with it. And then um, you have to deal with it. it it's not like um, it doesn't cure it, but it helps you deal with it. And having a dark sense of humour is a shield and no one should be ashamed of that. I used to train doctors at Guy's Kings and St Thomas's and the, the surgeons were, had some of the, you know, they had to deal with awful things constantly. And that gallows humour was always present. And, but you need that, but it's a release. And it also, it does change as a psychologist, I can tell you it changes the brain chemistry. So it, it allows, you know, uh, of course you're going to get sort of um, aftershocks when it, it comes and it hits you. But actually the, the, the important thing is it also gives you perspective and, and, you can, and you can come out of that moment. And the big problem happens when you get narrowed into that and that's all you see. And what humor does is it drops a little pebble. So it lets you, lets you see something wider. Last year, I, um, um, we tried to do a a panorama into the far right uh, guy, Tommy Robinson, and one of his people um, had fallen out with him. And she was, uh, what she said was that she'd fallen out with him and his online hate mob had come for her 
and they'd threatened her with an acid facial. And I couldn't believe that somebody who would return to the source of that level of threat, but that's what happened. She was a bit like Nancy in Oliver Twist. She knew Bill Sykes was a bad man, but she was still a bit in love with him. And basically she secretly filmed me and I was doing my job as a reporter, which was to win this person over and give us an interview. I can't give her any money, but I can, you know, do you want a drink? Have another drink. You know, she said, let's have brandies. Like, let's have limoncellos, blah, 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 blah. So, and I looked like a dickhead and I was a dickhead and I was foolish and I was conned, but I was conned in the context of somebody talking about acid attacks on, on them or threats of thereof. And that's outside my human experience. And so I'm in trouble and um, the BBC hit me with, um, um, they're, they're trying to um, get rid of me. I'm in such trouble that the BBC, uh, the, the union, the National Union of Journalists said, well, have you, have you ever had PTSD and um, post-traumatic shock disorder? And I said, well, yes. Anyway, so we'll go see a psychiatrist. And, and, I, and I, it's the, one of the worst moments of my entire life, and there's been quite a few of those. You're sitting in a kind of the waiting room. There's a couple of other nutters there too, but they're looking at me because I've been, a, I'm a bit famous because I've been on the telly. And I think, what are they in for? And like, it's super depressing. It's like a clap clinic without the previous. <laughs> and fuck, you know, Christ. And I'm super nervous and I go in meet this guy he's a psychiatrist i'm a fucking nutter i've never done this before in my life and he looks at me and he said before we start mr sweeney i just want to say i really liked your film on scientology <laughs> <laughs> anyway the bbc so he says uh, essentially this is i'm suffering from work-related stress and therefore the bbc can't sack me full stop um, and the BBC hire a professor of psychiatry to check me out, to check out my psychiatrist. And I go and see the professor. Um, and uh, the professor, I get in and I sit down and he said, before we start, I just want to say, I really enjoyed your film on Scientology. What do you want me to write? <laughs> <laughs> so I also think that not only is humour a shield, but it can also help you. And, and also you shouldn't, so that I have never been anywhere where there hasn't been, uh, where there hasn't a joke around. And Primo Levi wrote this, this wonderful book, um, if not now, when, about the Holocaust, in which he said, even in Auschwitz, people laughed. So the two professors um, carrying the, you know, the shit wagon um, to and from, um, the cesspit or whatever in this worst of all places they still entertained each other with their own sense of humor which kept them above the inhumanity all around one of my favorite books uh, a man's search for meaning do you know the victor frankl book um is uh, has you know sections in where people are surviving based on humor and one of the things he comes to the conclusion of is that actually he thought as a psychologist going in there that he could tell who was going to survive and who wasn't. And he was looking at sort of strong people who seemed to think, but actually a sense of humour and uh, some meaning in your life was more important to survival than, than if you've never read it, I'll send it to you as a book because I'm. It's I, I think it's one of the most astonishing books there is. When you're working in awful places, you kind of know big tough people. I'm not interested in those. I'm interested in um, small, slightly shy people who said, "But what about this?" And then, the, or the, and the, there is some, and, and you think that's interesting. I'm interested in that, and I, and I, and I, um, and also people who are not afraid to challenge me because I'm, um, you know, uh, I, I'm both a big bloke and also I have a. Um, a monstrous fucking ego, but it, I always like it when my members of my gang, my team, say, "But John, you're talking bollocks." You know? <laughs> yeah, but, you, but there's there's the key. You see, the fact that you can go, "I've got a monstrous fucking ego," means that your ego 
can't be out of out of control and is checked by yourself at times because you're telling people this. So you're introducing the, the fact that I like to have this checked at the door. So you, you're giving permission. And I think for people who are leading teams, this is important. This is important that you open that door for people, that you will humanize the whole thing. Last May, crikey, um, my cousin Paul Sweeney dies of COVID. He's 74, he's, he loves to drink and he's 19 stone. And um, so he's very, very heavy. And, and I say to his widow, um, my family are uh, from Birkenhead, though I moved around. So I said, I'm coming. And I uh, uh, took uh, Paul's daughter, um, uh, Rachel, who lives in London, and we drove up together, masked up, and we go to this funeral. And Sweeney family funerals are kind of orgies of drink and, and hello, how are you, and all those kind of things. And this is the most miserable Sweeney family funeral I've ever been to because we're wearing masks, there's no wake, there's no, you know, we're not staying in hotels. I've got to drive four hours back to London, da 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 da, da. it's grim. The service is beautiful. Um, then, but the, the funeral blokes, they're a bit small. They're not big enough. And I know Paul's a big guy, 19 stone. And... Anyway, they drop him in the fucking grave. They drop the coffin. And, you know, and his widow goes, ah! And it's awful. And we're all hidden behind our masks. And the funeral uh, director lady has got a wonderful scout sense of humour. I heard that Paul had a lovely sense of humour and I think he might have enjoyed his last ride. And then suddenly this ghastliest, the most ghastliest uh, funeral of all turns into he would have fucking enjoyed that too. And, and, uh, and then they righted the coffin. And then we also, and then we found our humour and our humanity again. And um, so I, I, uh, I, I take my, uh, the hat I'm not wearing off to this uh, lovely funeral director for having the, the kind of moral courage, the mental, the moral courage to seize that moment and crack a joke in that dark moment and, and transport us back into a memory of Paul's love of life. There, and the instinct to do it. I mean, the, and the bravery, actually. Yeah, it's instinct and bravery together. Um, what makes you laugh? I mean, because you're telling wonderful stories about sort of incidents. Is, do you laugh at regular comedy? Do you laugh at situations? Oh, yeah, I, um, so comedy, I mean, what is comedy? It is, I think, um, an animal thing. My dog's got a, a sense of humour, probably better than my own. Um, but it's, it's a moment when you are, you think you're being led down one track and suddenly the tracks jump. So, um, you know, we're all about to die going into a B-hatch pocket. We're being shot at. And then suddenly you're the guy who fell asleep in the Deborah's strawberry devil over. <laughs> and then, and that's a jumping uh, of track. And then the whole, and, and that's that, what you do is this lovely um, animal reaction, human reaction. You, you, you throw your, uh, your neck open to the enemy. You admit um, some measure of defeat. But in, in doing that, you, you're, you're bonding with people. So in Russian, uh, I'm a stupid dwarf. Um, now, I'm <laughs> 11 and, and big, but um, um, and the moment you say that to a KGB guy with a gun pointing at you because you're in Chechnya and you shouldn't have been in Chechnya and you might be um, a terrorist, and the guy's thinking about killing you. And he, the first thing he hears, I put my hands up and said, hello, I'm a stupid dwarf. Said, what? No, you're not a stupid dwarf. And then you go, it's a, it's a joke, but not a funny one. And, uh, and then, and then you, you're in a different place. The moment uh, uh, you're, you're most afraid, you, 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 you crack a joke and the, humanity, and the shared humanity of humour builds a bridge with somebody who's fundamentally, um, uh, who feels fundamentally opposed to you. And that can give you a break. So I've got two grown up kids now, Sam and Molly, and 
Um, Molly's developing as a young playwright. She also works um, in the charity sector. My son works for Bernardo's. He's a social worker. Um, and he's done some um, 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 difficult stuff with special needs kids who can be difficult and aggressive. Um, trying to teach them to read. The family team, because the family historically is from Birkenhead, the family team is Tranmere Rovers. And he was teaching a special school in South London. Which team do you support, sir? Which team do you support? Chelsea? Is it Chelsea? If it isn't Chelsea, why isn't it Chelsea? And Sam looks them in the eye and goes, I support Tranmere Rovers. And have you got a problem with that? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a great line. And then there's, uh, he was working with kids uh, who ended up in gangs, many of them uh, black kids in South London gangs. And the policy is rather than approach them in court, magistrate or, or crown court, if they're sick in hospital, that's when you, you say, can we help you change your life? So his his thing was to go, um, you know, and he's a nice posh um, middle white. He's not that posh, and he's probably not that nice, but he's a middle class uh, <laughs> white kid, um, and he's starting out as a social worker. He's also an amateur boxer, and he worked out that um, when he was sparring, uh, and he got a black eye, his hit rate uh, of recruiting these gang members away from gang life went up when because you just go in and they go well what about you know what's with the black eye they said don't ask mate just don't ask and that kind of again some bridge through the humor of it and so what happened was towards the end he started borrowing his girlfriend's mascara Shh, don't, <laughs> touch up and you just and you kind of know you know yeah that works and it works and it's also a joke and he can tell a joke but all that stuff so I kind of love humor wherever I find it I seek it out one of the curses for me of the I used to love going to comedy clubs and then the embarrassing thing for people who go with me is that I get picked on oh it's that John Sweeney you're the Scientologist fuck off etc <laughs> but I kind of love it I love reading um, the obituaries in the Times, where you know this fantastic war hero, and then if they're a good obituary, there's a, a, a gag at the end, um, or somewhere in the middle, where you think, ah, oh, you know, I really would have loved to have uh, met this guy. There was one the other day of a, guy, a wonderful United Nations guy called, um, I think his name was Sir Brian Urquhart. And he, he, he basically, he was the intelligence guy in the British Army who said that Arnhem wasn't going to work and they fucking ignored him. And Arnhem happened and it didn't work. Um, and he was a brave guy and he really pulled his corner, but he was outgunned and, and it was a very, very difficult time for him. Anyway, um, 20 years later, he's in the Congo and he's having an argument with a French para who's saying, um, you know, you're just a fucking civil servant and you don't understand the esprit de corps of the French par parachute regiment. And Brian looked at him and he said in perfect French, well, actually, in 1943, I started teaching the first free French parachute regiment. So fuck you. <laughs> 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 or, or the story was more polite but you know how it goes and you just yeah. say ah oh, you know that's a bit of so I, I I seek out those moments of of humor and the best jokes are told when powerful people don't want them told when when it takes real courage to tell a joke and those are those and and, and this for me is the aristocracy of the human soul. The people who have the courage to tell those jokes and those like the, um, like the, the funeral director at my cousin's funeral, who have the courage to seize the moment and tell, tell a joke that can suddenly transform the whole ghastly situation. So what would the world be like without humor? Not one I'd recognize, not one I'd want to I'm not so the, the world would be awful without a sense of humor. It's the thing. I mean, I love stories. You know, there are things which are dark and serious, but at the same time, there's always a joke. I always, I mean, I'm, 
I've just, I don't know if your listeners know, but I've just done a podcast about Jeanne Maxwell. Um, Which, by the way, before you even get into it, it is my favourite podcast of the last five years. If uh, Listeners, it is just compelling, compulsive and just brilliantly put together. So, um, yes, please check it out. The thing with this is it's a dark subject, but also there are moments of... Um, of 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 dark humor which i treasure um and then there's an old friend of mine roy greenslade who says um, um I, we, we're talking about robert maxwell who is Jelaine maxwell's father who now the point is that Jelaine maxwell is accused of these terrible crimes she denies any wrongdoing denies the six charges we'll have to wait and see until the trial um, as to what happens, but uh, in July, so we don't know. But her father was a monster, no question. I'm talking to old Fleet Street people who talk about this, and one of them is Roy Greenslade, former editor of The Mirror and a good bloke, and he says, so I'm on the phone um, all the time to um, Kelvin McKenzie, who's the editor of The Sun. It's like two Fleet Street editors gossiping over the side of a Fleet Street fence. And Maxwell one day comes in. What's happening is that Maxwell is, is, has got a, um, a former copper who's spying on the phones so that I think Maxwell is listening into these phone conversations secretly. And it's slightly, but, but Roy doesn't know that at that moment. And uh, Robert Maxwell, let's phone Calvin McKenzie. And his normal secretary, who's streetwise to Maxwell, isn't there. There's a replacement. And the replacement is told, get me Calvin McKenzie. And this is a phone conversation that Maxwell and um, Roy will have with Calvin McKenzie, the editor of the Sun. And then there's a long silence, nothing happens. And this woman who's very young, like 18 or whatever, and, and Roy's telling the story, he says, well, he, he went, he doesn't want to talk to you. What did he say? Says Maxwell. Well, I, I don't, I don't. I don't like to use this. What did he say? Tell me exactly what he said. I don't want to talk to that fat check. And <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that is that's the flavour of the kind of stories um, that we can uh, that we tell in the podcast. And the thing I love about it, uh, and I love podcasts, and I want to do them to the day I die, is that. They tell uh, it's as close to reality. Like if you were to meet me um, in a pub, I mean, obviously we've got lawyers and stuff like that and, and very smart editors and producers, but essentially this is unfiltered Sweeney telling a story about Robert Maxwell and then the Epstein stuff as well. Um, and he, I mean, Maxwell had a sense of humour. So, having a sense and he could see jokes about himself too some of the time so having a sense of humor isn't a foolproof thing um to speak to human decency there are people who with a sense of humor who can behave terribly as he did but essentially it's a shield against the dark things that happen to all of us from time to time and it's a way of it's a solve a salve do i mean it's something that that helps you get through life, and without a sense of humour, I, I, I can't imagine. Um, I can't imagine my own life. So, if you were to somebody asked you to make a business case for humour, generally, what what would you include in that business case? I wouldn't want to make a business case for humour, but what I would do is, I would say, if you're making a speech or pitching something. Stick a joke in and stick a joke in at the very beginning because people laugh and then basically I had a wonderful professor of philosophy, um, Wolfgang von Leiden, Wolfgang von Leiden, who was Austrian Jewish. He was turfed out by the Nazis of the of Vienna University in 38. And um, he came back in 45 and he said, as I was saying before, I was so rudely interrupted. <laughs> but he said, 
you can only concentrate for half an hour. And then, in my experience, your bottom becomes numb and thoughts of any interesting kind becomes difficult. So I will talk for half an hour and then we will discuss. And it was wonderful. So, but really, people are busy. You've got two minutes, you've got five minutes. And you, what you've got to do is you've got to make your pitch, you, your business proposition, whatever you're doing, um, trying to grab somebody's interest for a story, trying to convince somebody that they should sit down and I should interview them. You've got two or three minutes. You put a joke in there straight away. It eases things. It, so I wouldn't say, here's a business pitch for humour. I would say that the faster you could convey your own humanity, the better the fastest and cleverest way of doing that to somebody who doesn't know you is to tell them a joke at your expense. What you're saying is you can take the piss out of me and the world won't, um, won't cave in. That's okay. Having every now and then a sardonic sense of humour, because good fun. And I can remember um, one of my bosses at the BBC, who I miss, a guy called Andrew Head, um, I, he said, oh, I'm not sure about this line works. And I said, oh, don't take that out. It's really funny. And he said, let us be the judge of that, shall we? <laughs> so you can, um, and I think I've stuck that in. I've, I've stole it from him and stuck it in the podcast. If I'm a businessman, I'm not going to uh, lecture them or anything about what they do. I would say that you have a far better chance of winning over your audience if it's a difficult audience, if you tell a joke in the first five minutes. It's not a gag fest, but a joke signals something. It signals that you have a sense of humanity, a sense of humour, and you are willing, you know, you get it, that you're not a superhuman. That's Yeah, it's that's a social it. lubricant. It's a real thing. We're coming to the part of uh, the show that we like to call quick fire questions. Um, well, we don't like to call it. We just do call it that, actually, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, so, what's who's the funniest person you've ever met, John? Dalai Lama. Oh, hold on. <laughs> you can't leave that there. Sorry, mate. No, no, no. Quick fire questions. Uh, quick fire questions. By the way, the person I didn't meet him, but Tommy Cooper is my hero, hero, hero. But uh, Dalai Lama. Well, it, well, hold on, you've got to tell me why, okay, yes. Right. I interviewed him uh, for the Sheffield Telegraph in 1983 when I went to see one of my mates um, in India. I got terrible diarrhoea in, um, in the planes, and I thought, I can't, and I had uh, you know, three weeks of my return ticket, and I went up to the Himalayas, I turned the corner, and there was um, the exile home of the God King of Tibet, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I'm working as a cub reporter on the Sheffield Telegraph. My probation has been extended. I'm in trouble. And um, I, uh, I tell lots of lies and I get to see the Dalai Lama. In my rucksack, I have a Robin Day red and white spotted bow tie, which I stick on to do the big interview. Because I've run out of money, I've got no socks because uh, I've, I've walked my way through all the socks. And, and I ask a, a, series, a, a couple of very stiff questions, and clearly I'm very nervous and not at ease. And the Dalai Lama looks at me and he says, why are you wearing a bow tie but no socks? <laughs> <laughs> and then he, and he laughs, and he laughs, and he laughs like Sid James in the Carry On movies when Barbara Windsor used to pop her bra. Wah, 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 wah. And it's really funny. And uh, I, I, rather than having 10 minutes with his holiness, I had like two hours, and I got back to the Sheffield Telegraph and wrote three double-page spreads, my kind of world-exclusive interview with His Holiness the Dalai Lama in 1983, and the phone goes, and the news editor listens, puts it down, and says, there's been a murder in Barnsley. Where's the fucking Tibet correspondent? <laughs> and that was the moment I knew I was safe, and I might have a future as a reporter. <laughs> what book makes you laugh? Three Men on a Boat. Okay. Best travel book ever, and the pubs still exist. Um, and so I've, I've got a uh, canoe, um, and I'm going to, um, the moment lockdown stops, I'm going to do that book, you know, the, the, with the, uh, the wrong way round. I'll read it backwards, but it's really funny. Three Men on a Boat. What film makes you laugh? Some Like It Hot. Oh, superb. Yeah. Which I'm going to watch tonight. 
Oh, just, great. Also duck sleep. Also airplane. Um, it's a hospital. What? A hospital? It's a big building with sick people running it, but that's <laughs> right now. great fucking lines. Um, nice beaver. What word makes you laugh? Unguent. I don't know what unguent means. Unguent is an oil, um, you, but there's a kind of unctuous. It's the oil from unctuous. Oh. It's an oil, but it's kind of um, it's got a you can, you can it's got a smell of Uriah Heap in there somewhere, <laughs> a kind of creepy and yes, Mr. Sweeney, welcome that kind of thing. I'm going to take tilt it to another direction now. What's not funny? Cruelty. Um, bullying, um, um, a crowd against um, an individual. Um, those things can be uh, can be dark and horrible. Um, lack of pity, lack of empathy, lack of mercy, uh, humorlessness. That's not funny. Literally, <laughs> no, but, but that's brilliant. I don't think you can. Um, I don't. It's very hard to shoot somebody to kill somebody that amuses you there's a moment in um homage to catalonia where george orwell is about to shoot a fascist uh, he's a sniper and and the guy drops his trousers and goes for a crap and george lifts up his gun he's not going to kill a man who's going to go to the toilet because it's so human would you rather be considered clever or funny funny why um, if you consider yourself clever, you might as well join the um, the IQ wankers, and I think they're really stupid. And I know, so one of my mates, um, as I, I mentioned him, Jonathan Gabby, I went to school with him, and I used to pinch his maths homework um, at school, and I would get like DF, you know, because I was rubbish, and then I'd pinch his homework and get A triple star, and... <laughs> Then goes, um, he goes to Cambridge, does physics, and, and he's now a rocket scientist, um, literally a rocket scientist. But he's a wonderful sense of humour. And then every now and then uh, I was trying to do my son's homework when he was little. And I said, well, what's the answer? We spend hours. And uh, Jonathan just goes, the answer's nine. And, and so I, he's very clever. I've got another really clever friend who's in my podcast who I call, um, he's called Ash. And I, you know, I met him in a pub, which is kind of true. But he's the professor of uh, neuroendocrinology at Oxford University and super, super clever and a great doctor. And he's got a great sense of humour. And, um, and we, we went on a drink one day and he said, you know, the problem, John, is that if you screw up tomorrow, then, um, then all that's going to happen is you learn the BBC in a multi-million pound libel case. But if I screw up, I kill somebody. That's not good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but... It's also um, uh, so that I know clever, truly clever people, far cleverer than I will ever be, and they have a, um, a proper sense of their own humanity um, as well. So I'd far rather be thought as being uh, funny than clever. And I'm suspicious of people who play clever, or also who play stupid, like Boris Johnson plays stupid but is clever, but he's not as clever as he thinks he is, and he doesn't work hard. And if you don't work hard, however clever you are you're effectively stupid um because you've got to do your homework and finally desert island gags you've got one gag that you can take with you to a desert island what uh, is it? so me and my first wife mother of my kids um we had a tiny house in hackney by railway line and um uh, sam's born newborn baby and then there's a big rat scurries across and it's terrifying, a newborn baby, uh, she's sick with worry. Um, we go on the council and these the, the two rat catchers come and they're, they're great. And they love um, Tommy Cooper. And uh, they, get, they come back and they become like family friends. And I think actually the BBC, completely separately, I work for the Observe this time, BBC does a documentary about them because they're so funny. Or what, anyway, they're great characters and they're lovely. Um, and this guy, one of them, I'm going to call him Terry. I don't know whether I, that's, it was a long, long time ago. Um, 
but Terry loves Tommy Cooper, and he uh, he goes out to Kent to a pub, um, uh, a, a, a small pub near Canterbury, and it is the annual outing of Kent University's Tommy Cooper Appreciation Society, <laughs> with a hundred students wearing fezzes sat in a pub, going just like that, just like that. And all I can remember is Terry the Rat Catcher, while sort of putting down this sort of terrifying rat poison to kill the rats in our tiny home, just going. John, it was the best day of my fucking life. Just like that, just like that. And, and that celebration of, of humour over, over fear um, is lovely, and it sticks, it sticks in my mind. It's a moment rather than a joke, but, um, but I love it. You'll take that moment with you to the desert island. John Sweeney, it's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, I'm afraid, you know, that I couldn't sort of make a wallflower out of you. Uh, you've absolutely just given us stories galore, laughs galore, and a lot of joy. Thank you so much for being on the Humorology podcast. Uh, it's been a, a pleasure, um, Paul, and um, you know, I've enjoyed it. Uh, but actually, I feel a bit kind of emotionally drained, so I'm going for a drink. <laughs> the humorology podcast was hosted by paul barros and produced by simon banks music by steve hayworth creative direction by les hughes and additional research by helen sykes please remember to subscribe like and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts this has been a Big Sky production.